Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. Hello, and on today's episode of Afternoon Light, I'm talking to Dr. Richard Pomfret, who's been an emeritus professor of economics at the University of Adelaide, and he's an expert in international development and international trade. Welcome to Afternoon Light, Richard. Thank you, Georgina. Pleased to talk to you. Oh, and thank you very much for having me in your home here in Adelaide. Yeah. It's, it's lovely to be back in Adelaide for a couple of weeks, although the weather isn't as I would have hoped, as we were saying before. It's unusually wet for the dry city and the driest continent. <laughs> right. But today we're going to talk about a book you wrote some years ago, The Age of Equality, the 20th Century in Economic Perspective. And in this book, you use the French revolutionary liberté, égalité, fraternité as your sort of organising theme. So can you talk to me about the predecessor to the age of equality, the age of liberty and why it was so before we get on to the age of equality? Okay. Yeah, I mean, the idea, obviously a little bit of a simplification, but I think the really big pattern in the century before 1900 was this rapid growth of the, the Western European economies that come to dominate the world. And that's really based on capitalism. It's based on individual freedom of the people who were the capitalists, maybe not the people in the empire. It was huge. It was the biggest expansion of economic activity we've ever seen in the world. But the problem with the, all the records we have, that was the peak of inequality. So that was a big issue that came with the Great War. You know, how do you get the benefits of capitalism without having this blatant inequality? The big challenge, of course, came from the Soviet Union with the Russian Revolution, which promised prosperity and equality. The response of the, the rich countries, including Australia, was to gradually move away from this sort of pure capitalism to introduce a welfare state, equality of opportunity with universal education, better health care, equality of outcome with progressive income tax and so on. And in the second half of the 20th century, you know, clearly that model was the one that, that won against communism. In a sense, very, very simply, all over by the, the 1990s. Facts along the way, or steps along the way, we saw in the middle of the century, we saw the appeal of what we now call populism or fascism, which tried to offer a better outcome under a charismatic leader like Mussolini or Hitler. But in the end, I think it's really clear by the 1990s that it was capitalism plus some form of a welfare state was the dominant system. So that's fantastic to get that real overview of how we've gone from an age of liberty to equality. And I know your next sort of iteration is, of course, the age of fraternity. Just going back to the age of liberty, because there are some quite profound changes that took place in that period, of course, the abolition of slavery. And as you said, that real focus on individual freedom, so freedom from slavery, You've got the collapse of the feudal systems of, that have been obviously prominent in the Middle Ages through that Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. We're just seeing all those collapse. But as you say, that it was a very unequal society despite those freedoms that we were yeah. enjoying. Yeah, I mean, even in the early 1900s, we see the remnants of the feudal, the old society is still there. Every major country, the head of government was an aristocrat in every major country apart from the United States and France. That's unbelievable today. Mm. You know, we wouldn't be having dukes and earls running the main countries. So there had been this big change, this big economic change, but very unevenly, the benefits very unevenly spread. I think that was the key thing. And was that because of the vestiges of the feudal system that we were experiencing liberty, freedoms, mm. but the feudal system still gave us sort of an overlay of yeah. Or to the victor yeah. or to the lords and ladies and dukes and duchesses go the spoils of this. <laughs> to some extent, yeah. yeah. After, I mean, to some extent, although a lot of them were self-made people, self-made men, obviously. You know, people like the Rockefellers or mm. Carnegie's in the United States. Uh, they had the opportunity and they'd taken it. They were absorbed in much of Europe by the, it's a classic thing, the, the man may becomes rich, his daughter marries a duke. So that it got shared as they were incorporated into the elite. But I think it was the opportunity. I mean, the real dynamism came from the entrepreneurs who were often pretty ruthless in, for example, the slave trade, big source of profit. 
And what was the thinking in that age of liberty then around sharing the riches that were being generated? Were there debates or was the focus very much on we are being liberated from all these sort of constraints of slavery and feudalism? Yeah, I mean, I think there were debates. I mean, there were social reformers, there were critics of what happened, but you know, writers and as well as politicians. But on the other hand, there was a tradition in the Western European countries and North America and Australia to a lesser extent, and we're a bit different. But if you worked hard, did well, found a good idea, you were rich, you deserved to be it. There was also, I think, pretty clearly little concern for the people in the empire who were not white. Yeah, that was part of it. It just didn't count. No. So the Age of Liberty, as you say in your book, very much a feature of the 19th century. What marked its end? It was First World War. Was this? I think that brought it to a peak. I mean, the point. things are starting before that. I mean, yeah. here we are having pressure for social reform. You know, the Labour Party is being formed. The votes for women. All these things are chipping away at it. But the really cataclysmic part, I think, was the First World War, particularly in Europe and the 20s and 30s are not good decades in Europe as they're trying to sort out what the consequences are. We have the Second World War, so it's almost a 30-year war in Europe. What we do see in the war period is the United States emerges as the dominant nation, really, because it was pretty much untouched by the First World War. And there was this idea of liberty to proceed as you want if you're an entrepreneur. Mm. And that was, I think, the peak. 1945 was the peak of when the United States was economically dominant. And then you get in the second half of the 20th century, the European countries, Australia, New Zealand, are catching up pretty fast with this model of capitalism plus the welfare state. And in 1945, obviously the end of the Second World War, you see the two kind of dominant powers mm. at the time mm. come out, the, obviously the United States, but then the Soviet yeah. Union has been created. Can you talk me through what that meant in terms of this age of equality and how the two different systems were offering? Well, the outcome was designed to be the same, but the means of achieving it was Yeah, so I mean, sort of the US uh, models, basically individual liberty, capitalist system, market-based system, and that would work out. And you would have some safety net for people more developed in Western Europe with the safety net, obviously. Soviet Union said, you know, capitalism is not the way to go. If we plan the economy, we can do better. We can have the same level of output, but we will share it more equally. And that was a model that was very popular in many of the countries that had been colonies. They hadn't had a good, exper- good colonial experience, and they saw this as a, a good way to go after they became independent. And in many countries, that very well for a decade or so. You're sort of the enthusiasm of independence, the building up an economy. But then the ones that remained fairly government plan, the economy starts to stagnate, as it did in the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s. So we saw that, I think, clearly that central planning did not work in big terms. It could not produce the level of prosperity that the market-based economies could. Why do you think in that sort of mid-20th century that equality became such a focus for government systems? I mean, why did they focus particularly on equality? What was it about that sentiment I mean, it's different in the communist countries, but in Western Europe, I think what was very strong was after the end of the Second World War, I think there was a sense that the First World War had not brought the major change that the majority of the population wanted. By the end of the Second World War, there was universal suffrage across Western Europe. You're in the UK, for example, the Labour Party win with a landslide in 1945. Churchill is going to be, be kicked out. You know, he's a war hero, but he was associated with the economic uncertainty of the 1920s and 30s when he'd been Chancellor of the Exchequer. And the government that came in, in the UK, and it's the same in the Western European countries, promised the National Health Service, education for all, alleviation of poverty by a safety net, unemployment. That was tremendously popular. Mm. I mean, when we see that kind of a moving away from that a bit and the recognition of the costs of too much government intervention in the, as we move into the 60s, 70s, 80s, but I think in 1945, there was a, a huge demand for new and better society. Not necessarily, but not a communist society. You know, the communist party is reasonably strong in France and Italy, but in general in Western Europe, it's not so strong here. Not actually so strong. No. Well, yeah. of course, Menzies tries to ban it. That's so right, yeah. <laughs> particularly <laughs> not e- strong. But even without banning it, it yeah. w- wasn't yeah. it. And in Australia, <laughs> then, Richard, again, the Labor Party, who was in government post-World War II, that's offering a similar set mm. of ideals. You know, we'll have education, health, a sense that everyone can get something. 
close to equal. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, that's a society by the end of the century. That's a society we had. And I think in general, people are fairly happy with that kind of structure. We can complain about specifics. Mm. And there's a fairly high degree of, I think, bipartisan support for that in Australia. But there was obviously a divergence here because in the United States and in Australia, it was definitely more of a kind of a a laissez-faire model, private enterprise model adopted than, say, in the UK, which had much more of a central planning model, even in a a capitalist structure. What led to that divergence between the sort of two Mm. parts of the West? Yeah, I mean, we get a bit speculative here, Georgian, but to me, it's a little bit the States, Australia, Canada, there's always the answer, idea was a frontier, there's opportunity for everybody. Yeah. It was a little bit harder, I think, in the sort of the big cities of Europe, if you're living in the slums, to believe that you could actually go out and make your own fortune. You know, there were cases, but not many. So there was more, I think, reliance on the government to try to provide the equality rather than you could all do it by your own effort. So in this a gap between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome, the quality of outcome is more guaranteed in Western Europe. Quality of opportunity is more important in the US model. So. And do you put that down to the US in Canada and Australia? These are newer societies, so they're not so much bound by the strictures of the old world, of the you know, yeah. aristocracy yeah. and the hierarchy, the feudal system. That opportunity is much more attainable, whereas in the Western Europe, in Britain... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's much more a land of opportunity. Yeah. I wouldn't want to push it too far. I think in the 1960s, there was a change in attitude there. I think that was a big sort of the idea for youth culture that you didn't have to wait your turn and go through senior. But yeah, I think the difference is still clear. Mm. You know, and obviously, there's a factory era in the UK, which was copied even by socialist governments. Uh, Mitterrand in France or Gonzalez in Spain, they actually did a lot of privatization, liberalization in that period of the 80s. So the Soviet Union, obviously, offering a very different economic Mm -hmm. model. And as you said before, it was adopted by a lot of countries, a lot of developing nations. But why did people think that that was a winning model to start with? Well, I think think the Soviet Union, they won the Second World War. Yeah. That was, I think, pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like the First World War where... Mm -hmm. Russia pretty much gave up. So they were really good at just churning out millions of tanks and artillery that won the war. They were really good at satisfying basic needs. And the part of the world I work on in Central Asia, in Turkmenistan, it's estimated that 20 women could read in 1918. It's universal literacy by now. Wow. These are huge. Primary education, basic health care, basic housing. Not what we want, but they provided all those things fairly quickly. So it was sort of offering a great efficiency of service delivery. Yeah, and And particularly for basic needs satisfaction. You know, that people, there were no famines after the Second World War. But it couldn't really get beyond that. There was no initiative, there was no improvements. But initially, the Soviet model was shown as an example of delivering your basic needs, mm-hmm. and this is why it's attractive to yeah. other nations. Which coincided with the independence of your know, much of the big empires of Britain, France, and yes. so on. So for the, the new government, particularly in, in Africa, I think, but also parts of Latin America and in Asia, many of them gave up on that, led by you know, countries like Korea and Taiwan, a bit different because they've been Japanese colonies. But we start to see in the 80s this Asian miracle which is countries backing away from that heavy government involvement. Mm. And that's been a big development, I think. And as you were saying, once you got to basic service delivery, you know, you got your basic health, basic yeah. food, basic levels of education, of numeracy, literacy. Beyond that, the Soviet model doesn't really deliver. So why is that? Why is it not capable of... Of reaching the standards, say, of the yeah. United States. I think a lot of things. I think it's a lot to do with incentives. Yeah. So when we look, we talk about the big breakthroughs of technology. But a lot of improvement in productivity actually comes on the shop floor. Mm. It comes in the office. And that just didn't happen. There was no incentive to do that in the Soviet economy. And the there was no profit. Made. There to was be, no profit to be had. had the planners told no you private, what to do. No private property. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there's no real incentive. You just try to get a job with a guaranteed wage. You know, you pretend to work and they pretend to pay you, was the slogan, yeah. <laughs> so it, it is stagnated. And we see the same thing happening in China and the Mao, but China did successful reforms to stimulate the economy, pretty much ceasing to be a classical communist economy, you know, it's still communist. 
um, see your countries like Cuba um, very successful in the 1960s, but by the end of the 60s in serious trouble. So it didn't have that sense of competition yeah. within the society. But of course, at a global level, there was competition between the Soviet system and the yeah. US sort of capitalist system. And you saw that on the technological yeah. front with the race for who was going to be first to the moon. Yes, so yeah. where there was that global strategic competition, the Soviet system was at least uh, able to deliver some hmm. advances in science and technology, wasn't it? I think the planned economy could do very well at meeting basic needs and it could do very well if it's focused on a specific thing. Yeah. So, you know, the elite education institutions, you know, one of them stuck in the Siberian Nova Sibirsk, they were at the forefront and they got a lot of resources. And they say that Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space. They didn't quite get the first person on the moon. They did very well in that. They did very well in the Olympic Games That's at winning right. medals. They did hopeless the most popular sport in the Soviet Union was soccer. They were... Not hopeless, but they never won anything at soccer because they, they didn't have a team and the imagination. It was more where you had just had training, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. So in Australia, in, in the United States, in Canada, they obviously were pursuing a capitalist system, but there was clearly a challenge to that system. The Communist Party mm -hmm. was active in all those countries. And as you were saying, yeah. Menzies tried to ban the Communist Party in '51. How did Western governments respond to critiques of capitalism? Because they were there. And obviously, mm. in Australia, Labor was offering quite a different model through their policies that mm. Menzies would criticise often as being very socialistic. And um, Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I do think, though, about, about the last quarter of the last century, we clearly saw a convergence of major parties between like a social democratic left party and a more market-based right Pretty much everywhere. I mean, I think very clear in places like the UK with people like Wilson or France with Mitterrand or Gonzalez, I mentioned in Spain, who had this idea they were from the far left, but in office they were doing privatisation. We saw it, I think, in Australia to me between 1983 and the 2003. We had substantial bipartisanism. You know, when the big liberalisation, you know, starting with Hawke and Keating and followed by Howard, there's not much diversion. There's a lot of vitriol at the elections. Yes. I will never, ever introduce a value-added tax and then you have a GST. And then you do. <laughs> and it could have been either party could have done that. Yeah. Yeah, so, and rolling back the protectionist trade policies, which has been a feature of Australia but way past the due date by the 1980s, that was not being controversial. It's opened up a bit again, I think, in the last 15 years or so. But there was that shift. The key was seen to win the centre at politics. But there was also commitment to soften the edges of capitalism, wasn't there, mm. through, oh, yes. through the 50s and 60s yeah. with welfare state measures. So yeah. the Menzies government yeah. obviously focuses on child endowment. There's support for education, particularly mm -hmm. tertiary education yeah. in Australia. It's l much less so in the United States, but you have different approaches throughout yeah. the West, don't you? Yeah, and the United States, there's a huge difference between states, actually, I think, which has become wider. But he, we see in South Australia, I mean, something like Playford was not a free market person. No. Did a lot of intervention. Mm. Yeah, mm. So, so I think that blurring between this pure capitalism of the pre 1940, which actually was always a bit mooted in Australia, I think. But yes. it's certainly, you know, the size of governments everywhere was tiny before 1914 compared to what it was after the Second World War. That was a big difference. And was that because the expectations of society demanded that or was that a purely pragmatic political ploy? No. I mean, <laughs> well, I think the government obviously increases <laughs> during a major war like the Second World War. Yeah. And maybe there's some reluctance to roll it back by the politicians. But I think there really was a demand for better life for all. That was a vision that was largely fulfilled, I think, in the 30 years after the Second World War. Mm. You know, I, mean, I think we look back at just how dramatic a change that was in people's living standards and how that spread through society. You know? And you were seeing that in the West, but in the alternate model in the Soviet <laughs> Union, you were saying it's pretty much you reach a point where there's a level of stagnation. You get the yeah. basics, but are you getting the next, the alpha? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, I think the Soviet Union is pretty well in the 60s, early 70s. I mean, one of the interesting things is if you ask people what they think of Brezhnev, 
So a lot of older Russians would say, well, Brezhnev, that was really good. That was when things were good. We should get back to that. That's probably the Brezhnev of the 60s. If you talk to people in the West, well, Brezhnev was the guy that oversaw the decline of the Soviet Union going into Afghanistan and so on. So it was during his long, long rule in the 70s, I think, that switched over from looking fairly positive, if you're, particularly if you're a poor person or a poor country, to switching over the Afghanistan debacle in the 1980s kind of highlighted it was no longer a superpower. Mm. You know, mm. Others learned about Afghanistan later, but at the time it seemed like you're a superpower and you can't beat these tribesmen in Afghanistan. Yeah, well, and the, the other superpower has uh, found <laughs> the same, similarly yeah, yeah. But in the 80s, that, yeah. that went against the Soviet Union. But in, in the United States, across Australia, we see a real boom in the 50s and 60s in mm-hmm. economically, the, the golden era. Yeah, yeah. Australian unemployment is, you know, 1%, 2%. It's extraordinary. I mean, there's a statistic that at one point... In South Australia, there were only three people who didn't have a job. Right. I mean, just, <laughs> yeah, just yeah. amazing. What was it about the system and the policies that were being adopted in that period that led to such a, a global boom in the capitalist West? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it was recovery from the second world that started off, but also it was a good system. Yeah. The whole global market system had been really disrupted in the, in the 20s by the return to the gold standard was mismanaged. The 30s, you had the Depression, you had a lot of protectionism. And I think there was really good leadership from the United States in 1944, 45 in setting up the international system. You're know, based on an order of freer international trade, international institutions like the United Nations, which gets a lot of flack, but I think has helped to maintain stability in the world. You know, we're better off with it than without it. Yes, but also what about the importance of education? Education, I mean, you, that's very you important. Did, you yeah. didn't have compulsory school education yeah. up until I think the United States starts to introduce yeah. compulsory school education, which of course then creates a population who can do higher skilled labor. Absolutely. I mean, and the United States definitely took the lead there. I mean, in the 50s and 60s, it, the United States had pretty much, uni- they talk about a dropout in the United States in the 60s when I was young. And, and I mean, somebody hadn't finished high school, whereas in the UK, three quarters of people left at 16. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big difference. Mm. And you look at how many people went on to university or college or whatever. The United States actually provided a lead on that, which involved some government intervention. The GI Bill was particularly important to think in that. And in Australia, too, the investment in education, not just, as we were saying before, at tertiary level, but, of course, policies around non-government education, too, where the federal government's stepping in to subsidise that Catholic system and the, yeah. and the independent system, which is around giving parents choice between education systems. Yeah. And I think, certainly in many decisions, my understanding of this, and your colleague, Zach, is, knows more about this than me, but my understanding is that that was partly to say that it's often the less privileged members of society who want to go to Catholic school and there's this problem of affordability. You know, we will support them to do that. So in that sense, it was a step towards the universality of um, secondary education, mm. which was, I think, really crucial in that era to get to that point. And I think we're getting to a similar point in recent years of it's becoming really crucial that teenagers go on to university yes. to get the sort of general skills they'll need in an economy well, you don't get a job for life anymore. You have to be flexible. And I think that's not completely understood by all governments, including sometimes Australian governments, but mm. I think it is really important. Mm. But that competitiveness when it comes to education, that was so important, wasn't it, to make sure in Australia's case mm. that our society was high school education, but then tertiary education and that you had the capacity to access that, whoever mm-hmm. you were. Through in the Menzies era, it was the Commonwealth scholarships, but also creating more and more universities. Yeah. You saw that across other countries as well in, in yeah. the West. We have a good system in Australia, but I think we have some issues with the access to tertiary education. I mean, I was shocked when I first came in the 1990s. I met a really outstanding student who's had a really good career. He's now a professor in the university system in Victoria. He was the first person from his school in the northern suburbs to ever go to Adelaide University. Yeah, amazing. And I was amazed that that could be happening in the 1990s. 1990s. We're improving, but there still is a big gap between the background of the students coming to the University of Adelaide, and I think that's the same in the other capital cities. Mm. 
going back to this golden age of the 50s, 60s, that we're doing well, economy's booming, people are earning more, you know, wages are, mm. wages are rising, inflation is low. Don't we wish we were back there? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but it does come to an end, doesn't it? It does come era? to an end. And so that sort of capitalist dream, yeah. our economic system doesn't always deliver consistent riches yeah. and yeah. development. Yeah, I mean, I think two things happened. For Australia, I think we were fortunate in, in the 60s when I think the type of policies, some of our policies as an international economist that I, I thought were not the best policies. We didn't take part in the great liberalisation of international trade, partly because we were really lucky we had the first minerals boom came in the 60s. So that saved us. The 70s is the global recession, you know, clearly triggered by the oil crisis, which tells us something that there are constraints on growth. There may be key inputs that we need or other things might happen. Political disruption, I mean, it was associated I think, with conflicts in the Middle East, which seemed a long way away from Australia, but clearly affected us. So we had this phenomenon in the, in the 70s of high inflation and unemployment because of these supply constraints and prices of key inputs. And that was a shock, but Western countries recovered pretty well in the 1980s, I think. I mean, it gave a stimulus to moving to more market-based outcomes in a lot of countries, including Australia, I think. How did we move from that kind of middle way, so we had a protected economy yeah. largely in the 50s and 60s, high tariffs, and there was an acceptance in Australia that our manufacturing industries needed that, and yeah. we wanted to have manufacturing industries to all these new migrants could come and get a job and work in them. Yep. And we argued, I think, in the international fora that we were a rich but developing country. So we got around yep. the pleas from the United States and others to liberalise. Why did we change? I mean, and also why did the sort of the Thatcher, the Reagan, the Hawke Keating, those reformist ideals, mm. they came out of somewhere. Why did the economic trends change in that direction to become very market-based, yeah. very market-focused. The shift in the late 70s and early 80s, actually, it was visible a little bit before the oil crisis. There was a certain kind of, not stagnation is way too strong a word, but decrease in lack of dynamism. You know, the US, it was based a bit on the Vietnam War, distracting people a bit. And there was a sense that the government was taking too heavy a hand in there. That was the problem, that in trying to ensure these better living standards, but also people wanted protection in terms of consumer protection and regulation of markets and so on, that that had gone a little gone too far. I think that was a recognition. And you know, the, the instability of the 70s triggered new thinking. So I think it's, you can't waste a good crisis in a sense. But it triggered new thinking that it's visible all, all across North America, Europe and Australia. There was clearly, there were political groups, political leaders that wanted to maintain the status quo. I think we saw that you know, very clearly in the, the tumult of the 70s. But as I said earlier, when we start to get the big reforms in 1983, and in some sense, it kind of needed a Labour government to push through the unions and others to get these reforms that once that started, it was fairly bipartisan. I mean, to me, it's really impressive, particularly from the 83 to 2003, just how you can have people coming from outside saying, look at the swearing in Parliament and how people treat them. But it was actually bipartisan on the big issues. Yeah. But in other countries, say, for example, in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. where Margaret Thatcher, I mean, she came in and really shook up the whole system and, yeah. you know, the coal industry was basically... Yeah, yeah. Sent packing and her reforms were done in the face of some very, very difficult economic circumstances. Mm -hmm. So out of a crisis comes this quite dramatic shift yeah, to yeah. the market. Yeah. I mean, the crisis was having so different effects always in different countries. In the UK, I mean, it really almost destroyed the Labour Party as an opposition. I mean, it split into Labour and the Social Democrats, which partly enabled the more united Conservatives to have rule through the 80s when we had the big reforms. But then, you know, when Labour do finally come back, it's with Tony Blair, who is not a radical, you know, called Tony Blair a communist sort of thing. So I think there was that movement to the centre. The left parties realised they had to occupy the centre as Social Democrats if they were going to ever get power again. And at the same time, the successors are leading the Conservative Party in Britain. They've talked about one nation and not kind of tooth and claw capitalists. You know, in fact, Boris Johnson's big thing was to sort of establish his basis in the north of England. It's not clear it's going to work, but recognition there had to be some government intervention there. 
but it's nowhere near the government intervention of the Labour Party in Australia or UK in the late 40s. And what about in the United States context, which of course yeah. we all look to as the leader of the free <laughs> world, and Reagan gets in and he and Thatcher are fellow travellers. How does he drive that agenda that had been quite different from before? I mean, he was, I think, more extreme than Thatcher in a sense. I mean, you know, when the air traffic controllers went on strike, Reagan just fired them all. Mm. I mean, Thatcher never got that far. And it, was a, it was a big change. It was a sea change, I think, having Reagan in. And when the Democrats get back in under Clinton, I mean, Clinton's no communist. No. He's very middle of the road. You know, he's going to do something a bit to the left of what um, Reagan would have done, but it's not going back to anything. That era that we go into in the late 70s, 80s of real market-based reforms, I mean, that's coming from in the United States, in the UK, parties from the right in Australia, as you said, yeah. <laughs> you know, strangely coming from parties from the left. But it changes the left of oh, politics, yeah, yeah, yeah. doesn't it, in these capitalist countries, that they all end up being champions of economic liberalism. That's right. Yeah. Which for some of them has become a very traumatic for the left parties. You yes. know, the big divides in, in the UK, something like Corbyn, the party faithful wants somebody further left, which is disastrous electorally. Yeah. In the Italian elections we saw this weekend, the left is being swept aside because being a centrist party, they're not appealing to either of the extremes. And, yeah. I, and I think that's one of the things we've seen in the 21st century is there, there is this movement a bit to end what's seen as the Tweedledee, Tweedledum kind of politics of parties, trying to emphasise the differences. And if they're not emphasised, then new parties come along and take the lead. So, like Trump. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. And do you see a history repeating itself then? We've had this age of equality. Yeah. But where are we now? Well, the next step is the yes. age of fraternity, yes, right? Yes, yes. Which I think is, has got to happen because yeah. in, in an age with, with nuclear weapons and global warming, there's got to be some global agreement on these mm. things. Well, we hope we can't really have major wars anymore between major powers. Um, I think there are global things that need to be tackled. But getting from here to there, I think there are similarities to what we saw in the 1920s and the 1930s. We talk about the competition between communism and capitalism, that really the Cold War is really after 1945. Mm. In that interim period, it's more real uncertainty of you, you get, you know, fascism being the most obvious challenge that comes and goes. And I think to some extent we're seeing that here, that fairly messianistic leaders who promise that they will sort things out, whatever things, are quite popular. Mm. And I, that, I mean, we've seen that very clearly with Donald Trump, seen that with Italy in these new elections. But there are other countries where it's a challenge. I mean, in Australia, I think to some extent, the Liberals have lost a little bit of momentum because they've moved too far away from the centre. Hard to know what Labour's done. I'm not quite sure about Albanese at the moment. Yeah, maybe <laughs> leave it another couple of years to make more fulsome judgment. <laughs> but in terms of that attractiveness of the political extremes mm. you're seeing in countries around the world, where does that leave us in terms of our global economic governance? Well, with problems, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of opposition to globalisation. That is, I think, really clear. That is the fundamental. Most of the people we see are the charismatic leaders, whether it's you know, Trump or Bolsonaro in Brazil or Orban in Hungary, what they're appealing to is a nationalism, mm. you know what I'm saying, and really trying to turn their backs a bit on globalisation. I don't think that will be successful because globalisation brings a lot, a lot of benefits. But it's very easy to say, hey, somebody lost a job because of competition from externally. I suspect it's a bit limited in Australia. Because we opened up very late, we're just seeing in the last 20 years some of the benefits. You know, you look at the roads, we've got a lot of choice of cars. We've got a lot of choice of many things that we didn't have. You know, we've just put in solar panels. That's a great example of globalisation. Something invented in France, developed in the US, panels are produced in China, and we get them in Australia. Yeah. It's great. But, you know, people, it's very easy to, I mean, I don't like nationalism very much, but it's very easy to arouse nationalism on, on some of these things, you know, particularly if you can target a nation where the people don't look like your people. So I think there are, are these problems. There are serious problems. You know, I wonder what will happen with some of these more extreme governments. Yeah. And <laughs> we look again at Russia, obviously Soviet Union collapsed. Mm -hmm. Late 80s, early 90s. So 
you've spent a lot of time working in former Soviet yeah. <laughs> states, obviously looked at the way their economies are run. Are they experiencing a shift back to the old ways or is there a concern that we are entering again another Cold War with two competing systems? I mean, I don't think they're shifting back to the old ways, but I mean, when you look at, at Putin in Russia, you know, he harks back to the Soviet Union as a time which he conflates a bit with a time of Russian glory as well. But I don't think he's got any intention of going back to a centrally planned economy. Mm. You know, he's become too rich. Cronins are too rich. So what he's turning to is a sort of a nationalism, I think, much more than communism. Yeah, you know, and that's, I think, a bit the worry. I think that's what's happening in China a bit, that China had been very successful, but under Xi, it's, there's a bit more assertion of nationalism. And that becomes a bit irrational sometimes. Mm. You know, as we see in Ukraine, what might have started off with kind of limited war and understandable, as Russia's been pushed back a bit, we're not at all sure what's going to happen. Mm. You know, um, yeah, as, as we saw with the fascist regimes, I mean, Hitler and Mussolini went to the bitter end before they died rather than giving up. Yeah, 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 yeah. But in terms of the Russian system as it is today, the kind of crony capitalism, yeah. where there, there's a certain, the oligarchs get yeah. a very large yeah, yeah. piece of the pie. Is there, is there a challenge to that? Oh, I think, yeah, there were major, major riots. It's amazing, it happened in all the major towns in the country. And there were really riots against the previous president and his family who had become very rich. And it was authoritarian, so people didn't have put in the past, but technology means you can see pictures taken of their estates and their wealthy mansions. The same with Trump in America, we can all see what Mario Lago looks like. And people don't like that kind of inequality. Mm. I think the Russian economy was actually working, because in where it started, the end of the Union, was actually not working too badly in the early 2000s, and that was a great advantage to Putin. You know, the economy wasn't working too badly, and you got the rise in oil prices. He was a lucky man. <laughs> what do we do, though, when we're faced with this nativism that is yeah. really pushing against globalisation, pushing against free trade? I mean, we saw with Donald Trump and, and in China, the, yeah. the trade war there, and they were, you know, yeah. erecting huge tariffs and saying we're not going to import various items yeah. because yeah. you're destroying our industries. And then deals were done, but that obviously hurt other countries who were used to free trade between, um, between you know, yeah. America. Luckily, Australia seemed to negotiate our way slightly out of yeah, uh, yeah. the worst yeah. possible effects of that. Even more, we're seeing concerns around technology transfers and the strategic consequences of that. In Australia and Five Eyes countries, we banned Huawei, yep. the Chinese technology company, from operating telecommunication systems here or setting them up. So, you know, we're seeing a bifurcation in the global economy and a pushing back against free trade, which for generation has seemed to be the way mm. to do things. How do we counter that? Yeah, I don't know if we should generalise on that. You know, clearly, I mean, the, the Trump administration was a shock, the extent to which they tore up treaties and working against the international system. Yeah, I think there is a role for, for middle powers like Australia. To me, the main initiative has been the kind of clumsily labelled and comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah. But that includes Australia, Japan, Canada, Mexico. These are all fairly major middle powers committed to extending the World Trade Organization to have rules. We've forgotten about tariffs because they've gone in these countries. They're not going to come back. But have rules about um, digitalization, about services trade, and about regulation. To me, that's very promising. The UK wants to join mm. the CPTPP. It's very promising, but it's always a problem in an international system about how do you harness the really big powers who think kind of they can do what they want, which is essentially you know, Putin's stance. It seems to be shared a bit by Xi, shared by Trump. That's the problem. The world was really lucky that in 1945, the United States did sponsor a global system that was more cooperative than that. And as I say, in the age of uh, fraternity that's coming up, we need to go that direction. But th there are a lot of worrying signs, I agree. Yeah. And not least in your home country, you had another curveball, which was Brexit. Yes, that's um, right. Yeah, which I will show my colours here. <laughs> I was a big, big supporter of Brexit. I'm a former diplomat. I saw the potential for Britain to re-enter the world as a foreign policy actor in its own right. Mm -hmm. And we've seen most recently on Ukraine, Boris Johnson, who's Prime Minister 
up until very recently of the UK, was able to forge a a foreign policy response to Ukraine Mm. that if the UK had been part of the EU, arguably, it wouldn't have been as robust. So there are certain benefits. But of course, in terms of your sort of age of fraternity, that presents a challenge. I think there's a clear challenge. The age of fraternity requires that we have cooperation at the global level. But the challenge is nobody wants a world government in the sense that will be telling us all what to do. So the challenge is to have cooperation where it matters, to also have scope. It's what the EU calls subsidiarity. The scope for national governments to make decisions that apply to their country because nation states are largely defined by differences in attitudes, cultures to their neighbours. That's why they're separate nation states. And then within nations, you know, what should be done in Canberra, what should be done in Adelaide by the state government, what should be done in Adelaide by the city government. These are really hard things to work out. Yes. Um, there's always somebody wants to push power up or down, right? And I think that's a big challenge we have, a challenge of governance. And Europe really illustrates it. You know, what extent I think the EU potentially has a lot of benefit for Europe in terms of collaboration. Things like the gas crisis, if there was a better integrated market, it wouldn't be so severe. So things like that. But on the other hand, you've got to leave space for different nation states that have different attitudes to how the society should be run. Yeah, indeed. Well, it's, and as you say, it's an issue we come up against here in Australia, let alone in the yeah, EU, yeah. a yeah. much it's universal, much broad, yeah, much broader yeah. system. Richard, are you optimistic about the world? About yeah, the global economic system. Uh, I am, but I get really afraid of situations like the Russian one at the moment. Yeah, I get very afraid when power gets concentrated in. We don't know how much power Putin has actually, but it seems to get concentrated in a single person's hands, and that to me is one of the lessons from the 1930s too. But generally, I'm hopeful that the world will see sense. <laughs> And we will have an age of fraternity and resolve some of these problems in a way that our grandchildren or great grandchildren will say, oh, this isn't bad. Well, I think they won't be happy. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you ask for uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity, not happiness, don't you? So. <laughs> yeah, it's a different thing. I mean, I know that, that my parents um, that came out of the Second World War were really depressed about what was going to happen. Right. Because their memories were from the 1930s. Yes. And their lives just blossomed after that, mm. materially, certainly. Mm. Mm. Uh, and so I'm hoping we're a certain similarity, that we're seeing some dark clouds at the moment, but things will get resolved. Well, and we've been, of course, through the COVID-19 pandemic, been through an incredibly difficult period. But again, a period that begs the question, if we are focused on dealing with these global problems mm. in a cooperative way, surely we can overcome them much better than if we just yeah. fall into our individual nation state groups and the COVID I think was a great example of globalization you know some of the the ways of delivering the vaccines that were developed in the US and UK Sweden we came from a a company in Germany run by a Turkish immigrant Mm. yes (laughs) to me that's a great story yes (laughs) indeed well let's end here on a note of optimism Richard it's a much better way to be thank you so much for your time joining me on the afternoon light podcast wonderful to talk to you Georgina and good luck with the institute thank you That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook.